Well, hello and thank you for joining me for another Alex on Tech and ITY TV interview. I'm joined today by Palmer Lucky. He's described as the godfather of VR who founded Oculus VR and designed the Oculus Rift. Welcome to the program. Of course. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. Thank you for taking the time. Now, I normally ask this question towards the end, but what was your first computer and what got you excited as a youngster about virtual reality and how did you get started in this area? Oh, man. Well, going through those in order, uh, my first computer was, it was a family computer. It was a Macintosh Performa 630, uh, later with a color display. Uh, and then my first computer that I owned for myself was an, was an, uh, was an HP, HP desktop tower that, God, I can't remember the model name, n- model number, but had a, it had a 256 megabytes of RAM and a 900 mega- megahertz Celeron 3. Yeah. Um, so it was a, it, it was, that, that, that was a, that was, that was pretty incredible for me. Um, and I, I had that for a few years and then of course I got an upgrade wheel and spent all my money always having the best computer I could, I could afford, which sometimes was, was good. Sometimes wasn't, um, as for how I got into virtual reality, probably the same way that most people did pre Oculus, you know, reading science fiction. Um, I was a big avid sci- science fiction reader. I was really fascinated with the idea of being able to step into a virtual world that was parallel to the real world that seemed as real as the real world where you could do anything. And uh, that was that, that was what got me interested in virtual reality. That's what why I started Oculus. Uh, as a teenager, I decided that I wanted to work on virtual reality as a hobby because I knew that it might not be the next major computing platform, but I thought it would be the final computing platform. So I didn't want to just you know work on bigger monitors and you know faster graphics cards. I wanted to skip to whatever it was going to be at the end, which was VR. And after a few years, I figured out how to use some tricky software to replace functionality that traditionally had been done using very expensive hardware. And I was able to build a headset for $300 that was better than a lot of headsets that cost $30,000. And that was the Oculus Rift. Right. Incredible. Yeah. Well, I remember my first experience with the VR was, uh, I think it was a game called Virtuosity or something. It was in 1992. Mm-hmm. You stood in this, um, uh, on this platform and you had this ring around you. You put the oh, headset yeah, vir- on. Vir- virtuality. 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 Yeah. And you were f- f- shooting at uh, dinosaurs and pterodactyls. And, and That's things. right. Dactyl. <laughs> that was, that was, da- that was Dactyl Nightmare running on yeah. some modified Amiga hardware hooked up to, uh, hooked up to their, to their headset. That was a really interesting piece of hardware. Actually, I met with the guys who, uh, I met with the guys who owned that company uh, before I started Oculus and was interested if they would be interested in licensing the name Virtuality to to to, to a new company. Mm. And their advice was, uh, they said, you know what, uh, we had a pretty bad reputation at there there at the end. You know, people getting sick and uh, you know it, it 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 not being too great. I, our advice to you would be probably uh, don't use the name. <laughs> so how did the name Oculus come about? Uh, well, the, the the name Oculus in Latin uh, refers to an, yeah, an nice. eye or yeah. or or a circular opening, um, and so that was that, that was really that was really the idea there. Um, I actually was working, I was working in a research lab, and somebody brought up the word Oculus, uh, and uh, and we all agreed it was a very cool word, and that somebody should use it for our company at some point. And uh, so a few years later, I I ended up using it. And clearly, starting your own company was the best way to kickstart the whole VR revolution. I, it seems like it worked out pretty well. Um, you know, at the, at the time I started Oculus, I was a college dropout. I was living in a camper trailer. And uh, the, the interesting thing about Oculus is I had a choice between starting my own company uh, or going to work at Sony uh, on their, at their new VR division that they were starting at the time. Mm-hmm. And so I actually had an, op- uh, I had an offer to lead a VR research lab in their, in the, in, in the PlayStation division. And, uh, I ended up turning them down. They came back with a larger offer that was harder to turn down. But at the end, I felt like starting my own company was going to be the best way for me to, to make something happen. So how has Facebook handled VR over the past five years since you left Oculus to found Andural, which we'll get to in a moment. And I mean, Facebook has even gotten rid of the Oculus name. It's now Meta. <clears throat> That's right. They've kept the Oculus name around for a few things. Mm. They have the Oculus Developer Center, or Oculus Developer Hub, and a few other things. But you're right; they've more or less killed the name. Um, the uh, they, they probably use it for the Oculus Developer Hub so that they can keep the trademark uh, in use, legally speaking, so it's still mm. protectable. At least that's my my theory. I, mean, it, I I I would be making different decisions if I were still there, if I were still running things. Uh, but overall. Facebook is putting an enormous amount of money into virtual reality. They're putting in far more research and development than anyone else is. 
Um, they're making some tactical uh, tactical decisions that I don't fully agree with in terms of what they prioritize first and what they're building first. And uh, in particular on their kind of Facebook horizons metaverse initiative. Uh, but but in, in broad strokes, I think that they're in a really good position to to win the VR war. So what are your thoughts on augmented, extended and mixed realities, which are distinct from virtual reality in that they are meant to augment actual reality rather than immerse you into a separate virtual world? And what are your thoughts on all the metaverses being built and yet to come? I mean, we just mentioned briefly their Facebook horizons. Definitely. I mean, the I, th- I think the future that I've always seen is that the metaverse is you know, not just a different world, but I mentioned earlier, one that exists parallel to our own. So mm. one that you can be fully immersed in or where you can open up spaces where you're you know, merging digital parts of the digital world with the real world, where you can have people in virtual spaces connected to real spaces and, and still feel like you're all present in the same space. Um, so I've, I've been a big fan of augmented reality for as long as I've been a fan of virtual reality. I think the lines right now are kind of the way that you put it, where there's AR and VR. I think in the long run, there's not going to be a huge distinction between the two. It's just every, you know, you're going to have a mediated view of reality that is sometimes more real, sometimes more virtual. Uh, and there's going to be a long continuum that people flexibly move across as they go throughout their day. Uh, so I, 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 I kind of see them as one of the same thing in the long run. Yeah, no, I, I I look at things the same way as well. I mean, I'm very excited for the augmented reality glasses that are long predicted. There've been you know all sorts of uh, demo videos. TCL, who's got their augmented reality glasses, had a cool little demo, but it was mainly around pushing this. Apple is supposed to be doing it where you can use the face ID to not have to worry about controllers, which of course is one of the things with the with the virtual reality platforms that we currently have. But you know, if you could wave a magic wand and change VR and presumably AR for the better, what would those changes be? <laughs> I mean, a lot of them are just the obvious things. Higher resolution, lower cost, smaller weight, something that's easier to that's easier to wear all day. Um, but I, I think the you know, those are all very obvious. I think the probably less obvious thing is you need to have a critical mass of content that convinces people that this is a thing they want to use in their regular yeah. everyday life. Um, the, the biggest issue with virtual reality is, in my opinion, uh, not the uh, it's not the cost. I've, I've, uh, you'll hear people say, oh, we need cheaper VR headsets. My opinion has been for a very long time that even if current VR technology was free, literally zero dollars, most people would not think that it's good enough or have compelling content enough to use it every day. Most it would only it would still only be a thing for nerds, and so there's a certain quality bar you have to hit, a certain amount of content you have to hit that makes it relevant to a large number of people. And uh, I, I think you have to get to the, the first. We have to get VR to the point where everyone would use it if it was free, and then we need to worry about bringing down the cost as much as we can. But first, we have to hit that that bar. That so that's my magic wand. Get VR to the point where if it was free, everyone would use it. Yeah, and certainly we're, we're in the stage where the internet is free with so much Wi-Fi everywhere and, and people voluntarily use it. So we're there with that. But yeah, we're That's still right. on the way to that with VR and AR. Well, like if, and it, I mean, I, I'll have people say, oh, I'm not interested in VR. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't think I'll ever really be, it's, it'll, I don't think it'll ever be for me. And I say, well, what if you could buy a pair of glasses for $99 that gave you, you know, the quality of VR that you see in science fiction, like The Matrix or Sorted Online, where it truly feels like you are in the place. And what if you could go anywhere in the world, you could do anything, you could, you know, anything in your imagination is is yours to do. And they say, oh, well, of course I would be interested in that, but that's not what VR is. I say, no, no, that's not what VR is today. Uh, we just have to get it to that point. And then I think there's very few people that will not be interested. Yeah. So... Let's get on to Andural uh, and why you're visiting Australia. You know, what is Andural? Sure. So Andural is a defense technology company that uses its own money to decide what to build, how to build it when it's done. And then we sell it to the United States military and our allies. Uh, this is n- not a not a radical business model in most industries, but in the defense industry, it's a very radical model. In the defense industry, most technology is developed on the government's dime using taxpayer money, it's trickled out very, very slowly on cost plus contracts that are, you know, they where the, the company will get paid for time and materials and then a fixed percentage of profit on top. This, of course, incentivizes them to come up with the most complex architectures possible, the most expensive systems they can imagine. And then they often make more money when they are over schedule and over budget than if they finished on time or even early. And so Anderil is, is, is a company that's trying to bring cutting edge technology like artificial intelligence 
sensor fusion and robotics uh, to defense products that we don't think other major defense technology companies are going to build on the normal government structure and that major technology companies are not going to build for the military because they need to preserve their relationships with China. Yeah. And so do you actually have any products as yet or is that uh, part of what you're doing to, you know, come to Australia and I guess other allies and uh, you know, get the right talent? Yeah, so we have quite a few products. Uh, our core product is called Lattice. It's an artificial intelligence the sensor fusion system that can connect together hundreds or even thousands of different sensors and effectors uh, and filters out everything that people don't need to pay attention to so that people can focus on the things that actually matter. So getting all the right information to the right robots and the right people at the right time. Um, and that's our core software product. But on top of that, we've built about a dozen different hardware products from air vehicles, to robotic submarines, to ground systems, to uh, systems that that take that hack drones and and uh, take them over or knock them out of the sky, and uh, we, we've got about thirteen hundred employees. We've been around for about five years now, and the thrust of what we're doing here in Australia is uh, we're building a new research and development and manufacturing base to manufacture new technology, not just for the Australian military but also for export to other markets. That's really the thrust of what we're doing here in Australia is trying to recruit more people for that office, recruit more people who are going to help us design and manufacture these cutting edge systems, uh, and also uh, meeting with a lot of customers and suppliers that we have across Australia. Well, that's a pretty good pitch to Australian engineering uh, talent, isn't it? It is. We've had a really good, we've had a really good run recruiting people, actually. We, we recruit some people from the technology industry, uh, you know, work that are working on consumer technology by telling them that they should come work for us where they'll still get paid well, they'll still get to work quickly on interesting technological problems, but they'll also get to do something that matters more than search engine optimization or, you know, yeah. advertising, advertising sales. Uh, and then we also hire a lot of people from traditional defense companies by promising them that we're going to allow them to move faster, not be working with government funding that's trickled out over the course of many years, but instead going all in from day one on things that we are confident we can build. And uh, that's been really successful successful so far. And our plan is to build up Andrew Australia into, a, uh, into one of our major offices where we have hundreds of people that are continuously working on new technology. And just out of curiosity, where will the headquarters be? Uh, Australians love to, you know, like in the US, I want to fight over which is the, the, the correct <laughs> capital city to have the, this, this facility in. Sure. Right now, our headquarters is in Sydney, and we're going to be building out a facility on Sydney Harbour to build the first three extra large autonomous undersea vehicles. Um, and so we'll be able to launch and recover them and do daily testing in the water, uh, you know, sending them out to do test missions very easily. In the long run, we're already looking at uh, facilities where we're going to be able to manufacture much larger numbers of these. So hundreds of these submarines, uh, both for Australia and the rest of the world. And that's probably not going to be in Sydney. And we've got a few candidate sites right now, but uh, they haven't, haven't finalized anything yet. Sure. So what's the chance the global war breaks out and that the balance of power negatively changes towards dictatorships and authoritarian governments before Andural can tip the balance back towards governments that respect and protect freedom, assuming that is what Andural ultimately wants its superhuman soldiers to be defending. That's right. I mean, we, we, we very much, I mean, you, you nailed it. That's what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, deter and defeat any of these nations that are threatening democracies around the world. And I think we're actually already seeing a slight shift towards, uh, you know, in the balance of power. I think that a lot of people never would have imagined that Russia was actually going to, uh, you know, get, get their toes back in the water in Europe. Uh, that, that, that seemed, that seemed un unthinkable. And now they've done much more than that. They've launched a full-scale invasion in, on Ukraine. And of course, the justification that they're using for invading Ukraine it applies equally to other European nations that used to that used to be in the Soviet sphere of influence, and so it's that that's that's spooky all on its own. Mm -hmm. Separately, China is rapidly modernizing. They are uh, engaged not just in traditional military uh, military posturing against our allies, but also uh, economically, they are taking over large chunks of Africa. They are going all in on getting African natural resources. Uh, on getting a lot of infrastructure there. And then I think uh, for years, they've actually been doing a pretty good job of influencing Australia. I think things are going in a better direction now. But I mean, 10 years ago, there was a pretty widespread belief that 
Australia might really fall into the Chinese sphere of influence rather than the rest of the West uh, due to proximity and the fact that the Chinese uh, are very interested in uh, Australian natural resources and and you know min, min, uh, minerals in particular. Um, I think that we're not going to be able to change everything on our own. You know, you mentioned will we be able to build everything in time? I don't think so. I, th- I think we're a small part of the solution. But I'm hoping that by changing the way that defense procurement is done, by shifting it away from cost plus contracts and towards more, uh, you know, self-funded R&D by companies that gives them an incentive to move quickly. I'm hoping that everyone can start to move a little bit faster and match the pace that we see in places like China. Yeah, well, we've certainly seen with Elon Musk and his efforts at getting SpaceX up and putting up all the satellites. I mean, the private sector has long been, uh, you know, predicted to make a real impact in this area. And it's taken a long time for that to happen. But now it's finally happening. And you're part of that uh, solution as well. That's right. Well, I mean, if you look at the defense industry over the last 35 years, it's done a pretty bad job of turning small companies into large companies and 35 years being really since the end of the Cold War. So, uh, you know, Unicorn is a company with a valuation of over a billion dollars. There's only been two unicorns before Anderil in the last 35 years uh, in the defense sector. And it's Palantir and SpaceX, both of them founded by people who had just sold their companies for billions of dollars. And Anderil was actually the third unicorn, also funded by, founded by somebody who just sold their company for billions of dollars, me. Um, and so we, we've unfortunately been in this situation where the only people who have been able to succeed in defense at a large scale are people who have already made billions of dollars. And uh, we're, we're now starting to see that change. Since Andro became a unicorn, uh, there's now seven or eight new defense unicorns that have come out. So more in the last few years than in the last several decades combined. And I think that's because we've been successful. We've proven that you can move quickly, that you can do this, that this model does work of spending your own money and then selling the product. It's the way that every other industry works, just not defense. And uh, I, I think we're already making making a pretty big difference, but I just gotta, just gotta keep pushing. Just reminds me, as you were speaking before about all the sensors and drones, I was thinking of Edith, you know, and Tony Stark. I mean, I guess you're a real life Tony <laughs> Stark, right? <laughs> I've, I've, I've heard the comparison. We have, we have a, few, a few differences of opinion, but Iron, the, the first Iron Man film is definitely my favorite Marvel movie. Yeah. Um, it, it was, that, that, was, that was a great, a great, great film. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the interesting thing about what we're building is pe- people compare it to science fiction um, and ask, oh, are you taking inspiration from science fiction? But unlike Oculus, I, I wouldn't say we're even taking inspiration from science fiction. It's just science fiction authors, they, they think about the future, what's likely to happen in the future based on what's happening today. Mm. And in their versions of the future, things like artificial intelligence and robotics are key to military technology because that's where what they see being important in the future. And so what we're doing today is we're doing the exact same exercise. We're thinking, what does the future of warfare look like? Uh, what are the things that we don't want to build today that can win the wars of tomorrow rather than you know re-winning the wars that we've fought in the past? And it turns out it's almost perfectly aligned with what smart science fiction authors have come up with. So um, yeah, there, it, it is really interesting how these things line up. It's not that we're copying what's in sci-fi. It's just if you try to predict the future well, you'll come to similar conclusions. Just makes me wonder if you've got any uh, sci-fi authors on your uh, board of advisors. <laughs> Not on our board of advisors, but I'm friends with quite a few of them. Um, you know, uh, and this has been true even back in the Oculus days. It turns out running a virtual reality company is a really good way to make friends in the science fiction industry. Um, you know, ac- actually, we had uh, we had uh, Ernest Klein who wrote Ready Player One. He was uh, he was a regular at Oculus events. He actually uh came to visit our offices a few times and uh was came to a bunch of our events and he he was a big fan because he had written this science fiction novel about virtual reality that uh we kind of ended up in part bringing to life for real much sooner than he had anticipated but uh yeah i talk a lot to science fiction authors to kind of hear their thoughts on on where the future is going because at the end of the day a lot of these guys they they're able to spend a lot more time than i am thinking about what the future looks like you know they, they can sit down and for two months just research what does the future of Chinese military capability look like, and what would what what are the technologies that could counter that? And I'm not act, you know I don't want to act like I outsource all my work, but it's definitely useful to get their perspective and see if there's anything that uh, I'm not I'm not considering that they have. So what else should we know about Anduril that we haven't already discussed? Oh man, well I mean we've kind of already discussed this, but we're hiring very quickly in Australia, and so I encourage people. If they're interested or if they know anybody who might be interested, they should send them to our website to take a look and look at the job listings that we have open in Australia right now and maybe keep checking back as we open up more and more 
specialized roles. Um, and I, I guess the last thing would be something that uh, we started this company with. You know, our, our goal is to deter is to deter the people who are trying to really uh, take down the the Western ideals of democracy. And uh, it, it, that sounds trite. It sounds very obvious. But the reality is, some of the most powerful countries in the world very much are not aligned with that. And we, we have to be we have to be very aware of that. I think that we are in a very good position if we can build the right technology. A lot of people are very cynical. They say, "Oh, it's too late. We, you know, we might as well give up." It's just the reality is that China is going to have massive influence on all of these nations, and there's nothing we can do. I'm an optimist. I think there there is time yet. If we make the right decisions now, we can have a really strong future. So that's that's probably the last thing I'll add. Yeah. So, what is some of the best advice you've ever received in life to help you get where you are today? My second last question. Oh boy, the be- some of the best advice. Uh, one of the best pieces of advice I've ever received is to uh, uh, is to, I'll, give, I'll give you two. One is to hire people who are better than you at everything. So the job of an executive is to make themselves obsolete. And this was a very hard lesson the first time for me around at Oculus because for a while I was the best optical me- engineer and mechanical engineer at the company, uh, but and I didn't really want to give up my you know, control of the design process over the Oculus Rift. But very quickly, I realized I'm not actually that good of an optical engineer. I'm not that good of a mechanical engineer. There are people in the world who are much better at it than me. And you have to be willing to hire those people and allow them to take those things from you. It, you know, the job of an executive is not to do the things you want to do or even that you're good at. It's to do the things that nobody else can do better than you. And most things, you're going to have to find people who are better than you at them. Uh, and, and, and under all, I've, I've, I kind of gave up at the very beginning and I said, well, I'm, I'm not going to be the best at almost any of the engineering. That's just a given. Uh, we're going to need to hire people who are far, far better than me in all these areas, which then leads into my, my second bit of advice. Uh, I get asked all the time by college students in particular, uh, how, how they should start a company. They say, Palmer, I love programming or I love, uh, engineering. Uh, wh- what advice do you have for me to start? Uh, software technology company. And my advice to them is always the same. If you want to work on technology, go work for somebody else. If you want to work on bullshit, start your own company. Because that is, that is the sad reality of running the companies. You're the final backstop for human resources and legal and fundraising and, and hiring and firing. A lot of these things are not what you think of when you think of starting a technology company, but that's what you actually have to spend a ton of your time. So I know this sounds a little self-serving as a guy who's trying to hire people, but it's true. If you really love technology, you're probably going to get to work on tech more if you are working somewhere else uh, than if you try to start your own company. And you'll also learn a lot of lessons about tech, which you can apply to when you do want to start your own company after having a few years of experience under your belt. Yeah, that's so right. Fi- I, I mean, go on. I, I, I would never have been able to start Anderall if I had not already started Oculus. I mean, the, Oculus, we we did very well, but we had a lot of stumblings. Like, they're, they're not always obvious to the outside, but we we stumbled quite a few times. And I was able to take those lessons that I learned in my many years at Oculus and bring them to Anderall. And that's the, the, that's the only reason we've done as well as we've done. Yeah. So what's your final message to ITY viewers and readers and to your current and future customers, employees and partners? Well, let's save the world. Let's save taxpayers hundreds of billions of dollars and uh, make tens of billions of dollars at the same time. Palmer Lucky, the godfather of VR, the uh, founder of Oculus VR and Oculus Rift, and now Andural. Best of luck with all of your endeavors. I hope we can talk again in the future. And thank you very much for your time. Of course. Look forward to it. See you. Thank you. Bye-bye.